You know, every new year, these fortune tellers, that's really what I call them, uh, future predictors, they come out of the woodworks every year. And through the years, I've really tracked some of them. <laughs> um, and I got to tell you that at least, and I want to be uh, very charitable, uh, so I'm going to say at least 90% of their predictions never come to pass. Uh, but because I don't spend time watching the news, I used to in the old days, I don't anymore, haven't done that for a long time, uh, I have the habit of in the mornings after my time with the Lord and, and I get fortified by the power of the Holy Spirit in prayer and time of scripture and so forth, I, uh, I, I have a I spend 10 minutes, no more than 10 minutes, and most times I'm standing up so I don't get too comfortable, and, 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 and read the news uh, headlines from around the world. And I have certain things that I, it, it will cover the world for me, just in 10 minutes. That's all I need. Um, and looking online, at these select outlets, is, uh, I, sometimes I, I read actually in, on a daily basis, both in English and Arabic, because I still although my uh, Arabic-speaking colleagues are leading the way, they'll probably laugh but, because I don't speak it, but I do read it. <laughs> and um, as I said, this time of the year, all these predictors of the future, they come out in force, and they're everywhere. Uh, this year is really no exception. Uh, one predicted that this coming year, we're going to see a nuclear holocaust. Uh, another one predicted that this is going to be the beginning of w the Third World War, but it's never going to end. Another predicted a famine of biblical proportion. Another predicted a cyber attack on all the stock markets around the world and going to be an economic collapse. Another predicted that Israel is going to be wiped from the face of the earth. You know where that comes from. Uh, and yet another is predicting a total collapse of law and order. And on and on and on. I'm not telling you this to depress you. Trust me. By the time you walk out of here, I hope you'll be walking on cloud nine. Amen? Amen. But here's the one thing that's not a prediction. <laughs> this is not a prediction. This is actually a serious warning. And I want to show you on the screen. Let me draw your attention to the screen. And have the camera on the screen so that people watching, they can... See what I'm talking about. Mr. Putin is now threatening the West with a special hypersonic missile, appropriately called Satan II. <laughs> you see that? Now, I've got to find out what Satan I is. <laughs> he said, it's almost ready. Please listen to me. Listen to me. If I were not a disciple of Jesus Christ, if I was not eternally saved, if I did not believe whether in this life or for eternity, it's both winners for me, if I did not know Jesus as my Savior and Lord, if I did not know that Jesus is interceding on my behalf and on behalf of every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ right now, I probably would not have got out of bed and came here. <laughs> I'm staying in bed. And if I believe a smidget <laughs> of what these people say, it would be a, I'll be de depressed, but I'm not. I am absolutely as optimistic as I've ever been, I'm as encouraged as I've ever been, I am hopeful as I've ever been because I know that my Redeemer liveth and He is interceding for me at the right hand of the Father. And so I face whatever comes, whatever comes. Um, it makes no difference to us who know and love Jesus. It makes no difference to us whether any of these predictions come true or not, because our confidence is never shaken, because our faith is immovable, because our uh, peace and our joy 
It's not dependent on the circumstances because our peace can never be taken away from us because eternal security in Christ is not up for grabs. For grabs. Why? Because we fully trust in the promises of God in the Word of God. And His Word said in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 24 and 25, but because Jesus lives forever, He has permanent priesthood. What kind of priesthood? Now, before I get to verse 25, these are two verses, and I'm going to quote them in passing. Before I get to verse 25, I want to tell you just the whole argument in Hebrew epistle here, the whole argument in this chapter is that Jesus is a far, far, far greater high priest than the Old Testament high priests. Uh, he is a high priest, not from the Levit Levitical side, but according on the, on the order of Melchizedek, uh, supernatural, permanent. And because of the resurrection and the ascension, he is now at the right hand of the Father as our permanent high priest, our permanent high priest who intercedes on our behalf. Now, verse 25. Hebrews 7, 25, therefore, remember I always tell you when you see the word therefore, find out why it is therefore. <laughs> therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to him. He is able to save what? He's able to save what? Those who come to him. And here it comes. Because he always lives to do what? to intercede for them. Praise God. Now, my beloved friends, that is enough for me to be able to say to whoever is predicting the future, bring it on. Bring it on. Why? Because my Savior is interceding for me right now at this very moment. I am thankful to the Lord that the Holy Spirit guided John, specifically John, out of the four Gospels to give us this word-for-word -word sample, example of how our Lord is interceding for us. Our Lord, while here on earth, just before the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, He gave us an example of how He is now interceding for us at this very moment. And so, turn with me uh, to John 17 that Johnny read very ably this morning, page 1,679. I want to tell you, I, I personally believe with all my heart that the Holy Spirit of God has inspired every word that is written in the Word of God in the Bible. I am indebted and grateful to the Apostle John particularly for his recording those words of Jesus in John 17 in the Holy Scripture, showing us exactly how permanently he is now interceding for us. And because it, it reveals to us what Jesus is doing right now, it will literally lift us up to begin the year and continue throughout the year being lifted up, being encouraged, being literally motivated to bring glory to His name. Can I get an amen? amen. Think about this with me, please. Think about this with me. Whenever any of us are facing trials in life, and we all have those, right? <laughs> I wish they were not the case, but we all face trials, different trials to different people. Uh, or whenever we're walking in the shadows or in, in, in walking in the valleys of life, and if you read my book, Trust and Obey, you know I've had many valleys in my life, and I'll probably have some more. But whenever we are experiencing pain or suffering or, or in the valley, and some Christian brother or sister would say to me, to us, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Just think how encouraging that is. 
how encouraging to know that the priests, because in the New Testament, all the believers are priests. We don't need a pre earthly priest to intercede on our behalf. We all intercede on behalf of each other. But this is way, 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 way more than even us interceding for each other. When you think of our great high priest, our permanent high priest, the one who paid for us by the shedding blood of his blood on the cross, our Savior, Redeemer, and Lord, our very Creator is now interceding for us. Listen, your name is mentioned in high places. Did you know that? No, not in the White House. That's junk. Uh, not in Buckingham Palace. That's junk. But your name is being mentioned in high places in the throne room of God. You are mentioned by name. <laughs> and John 17 reveals to us the inner thoughts of our great high priest and how he intercedes for us today. Listen to me, please. If this is not enough to bless you out of your socks in this coming year, I don't know what will, okay? I give up. <laughs> I've done it. <laughs> so I want you to think with me, think with me, think with me. If Jesus prayed for us, who are here right, I mean, who are living right now, if he prayed for us 2,000 years ago, before we ever were even a, a, a glee in, in our mother's womb, <laughs> in mother's eyes, if he prayed for us because he said, I don't only pray for these disciples, these 12, but I pray for those who will believe their message and come to me. So he prayed for us literally by name, knowing us 2,000 years ago. Think about how important it is for us to know that he is praying for us now by name in our circumstances that we're going through right now. Pray for you by name now. He's interceding for your illness. He's interceding for your difficulties. He's interceding for your challenges. He's interceding for your relationships. And he is interceding for you. And here is, here is the most thrilling part to me. He's going to keep on interceding on our behalf with the Father until we see him face to face. He will never cease to intercede. Three things I want to share with you very quickly here about Jesus' high priestly intercession in John chapter 17. First of all, in the first five verses, you notice our Lord is claiming his own glorification, which now he's appropriating. But before the cross and the tomb and the resurrection, he was claiming that, re that, that, that glorification, his own glorification, has already been promised by the Father. Secondly, verses 6 to 19, that's the longest part that he is praying for our sanctification. And thirdly, verses 20 to 26, Jesus is interceding for our unification, his glorification, our sanctification and unification. Look at this very quickly. I want to unwrap them very fast. First of all, Jesus claims the promise of the Father for his own glorification. Now, remember, this is before the cross, okay? So, having obeyed the Father perfectly, and this could be a day before the cross, before the crucifixion, uh, having obeyed the Father perfectly, his first intercession has been fulfilled, and now he is appropriating that glory with the Father. Inasmuch as our Lord Jesus Christ now is glorified in heaven, <laughs> please hear me right, Jesus was so confident of that coming glorification when he prayed those prayers. Why? Remember, before coming to earth as an embryo in a virgin's womb, Jesus dwelt in the glory and the splendor with the Father in heaven. Uh, before his coming down to our broken and sin-filled world, uh, 
before stepping down into this earth to deliver us from evil and the punishment of evil, our Lord Jesus Christ dwelt in the Father's power and great glory. Jesus Himself said that He willingly, 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 did you get that? Willingly obeyed and left the Father and left the glories of heaven to come to our broken world so that He, the sinless, perfect Son of God, allow repentant sinners who will come to the Father through Him and through Him alone to be accepted by God the Father. And you are accepted because of Jesus. And thus, when he prayed for his own glorification, he knew that that glorification is coming, but only after the agonizing death of the cross. Only after paying for your debt and my debt on that cross, his glorification is coming, but only after his perfect obedience to the Father. Why was he so confident as he intercedes for his own glorification? Because he knew that his father, listen to me, his father always, 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 how many times are that? Always keeps his promises. He was so confident. His father keeps his promises. So the question is, what does it mean? to be glorified. Oh, glory. We, we sometimes uh, use the word and sing the word, and we don't really give it a great deal of thought. Glory is the revelation of God's character. Uh, glory is the highlight of God's attributes. Glory is the shining of the floodlights on what God is really, really, really like. A friend of mine used to say, and accurately so, he said, you know, a lot of people praying to see God's glory. He said, if God truly manifests His glory to us in our current condition, we will turn into dust. And I couldn't agree more. We turn into dust. And that is why every believer, when they die, before they get to heaven, and see the full glory of God the Father, they have to put on a glorified body. They, we can't go in our current condition. And so we see truly the, the characteristics and the attributes of God. We cannot see that in our current condition. I'm talking about the full expression of His glory. In our con current condition, we, we'd be blown into smithereen. Think about it this way. If a person would land on the moon in a business suit. <laughs> I hate to I'd be charred in the first nanosecond. It's just sometimes you see the sun, the heat of the sun, literally behind the cloud and melts the gloom away. And that is why we must put on a glorified body before we get fully to heaven and see the full glory of, of our Father. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's long chapter, 58 verses, but it will show you Paul's argument is that we get closed. We're not going to be floating souls in heaven. We will have a glorified body. Otherwise, we could not see Jesus. We could not see the glory of God. And so, I can tell you, I can't wait. You see, our current body can never see the full glory of God and survive, not for a nanosecond. When Jesus went to the cross, the hidden riches and the radiance of God, His love, His truth, His mercy was partially revealed. And because of the fact that only Jesus is the full revelation of the glory of God, our pagan culture blocks His name. They hide His name. They deride His name. They even curse His name 
because they've rejected the glory that was revealed of the Father by Jesus. Oh, but for us who love Jesus, those of us who love Jesus, those who have lived for Jesus, He's our only hope. He's our only power for living. He's our only strength in times of trouble. He's our only authority over demons and evil spirits. He's our only authority over sickness and disease and infirmities. He's our only authority over sin and addiction. He's our only authority over bitterness and fear. And all oh, because Jesus' name has eternity built in it. Eternity built in that name. John Jonathan Edwards, whom God used to bring about the first awakening in the United States, was the president of Yale University this back when Yale started as a Christian school. He used to pray this prayer. He said, imprint eternity on my eyeballs. Imprint eternity. on my eyeballs. Beloved, that's my prayer. Look at verse 3. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, the only true God, and your Son, your only Son. And those foolish people in many a church would say, Jesus just the founder of another religion. Let them read that verse. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and your only Son. You know, so many people sometimes mistakenly think that they will experience eternal life after they die. Our Lord here in this very verse disabuses us of that notion. How? by telling us that eternal life begins the moment we know God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Eternal life begins in us when Jesus is enthroned on our hearts as our Savior and Lord. And that is why dying for the believers, listen to me, dying for the believers is only a change of clothes. It's only a change of residence. It's moving from the basement to the penthouse. It's moving from the tent to the mansion. It's moving from the slum to the posh. It's moving from the perishable to the imperishable. It's moving from the limited to the limitless. It's moving from weakness to strength. Praise God. Give Him praise. So what does it mean for Jesus to pray for His own glorification? He was looking beyond the cross. He was looking beyond the resurrection. He was looking beyond the ascension. He's looking to returning to his former splendor before he left heaven to come to earth. And that is why I tell you that we can face the future with confidence. Our name is mentioned on high places. We are known to God. We are known to him by name. He knows everything about us, and He still loves us. A great man of God who accomplished, let me repeat this, a great man of God who accomplished in 30 years, in 30 years, more than all the missions to the Muslim world have accomplished in hundreds of years. This is the story, this untold story, certainly in the West. This man baptized thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Muslims who came to Christ. Dear friend, I've known him for 60 years. He's gone to glory now. But when the government authority tried to clamp down, tried to threaten him, try to stop him. And they would say to him, we're going to put you in prison. He said, praise God, how wonderful. And he said, you have, you know, they're just sitting there in his house. And he said, you see that bag by the door? Every time you visit me, you've seen this bag. 
It's packed. It's ready for me to go to prison. As a matter of fact, I just change a toothpaste every year. <laughs> and, and, and what a wonderful thing that would be for me to have time to write books that I've been wanting to write. I don't have time to write. They, then despair said, we're going to deport you. And he said, oh, that would be wonderful. My poor grandchildren living in America, <laughs> they have not been able to spend much time with me, and I'm not able to spend time with them. What are, are you going to do me a favor if you deport me? No matter what threats he received, he thanked them, and he assured them of his prayer for them and for their family members. <laughs> I, 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 at the like of which I've never known. His phone was bugged by the authorities, and they listened to everything he says and everything anybody else says. And I used to call him on a regular basis back in the 80s, and I would call him, and he would stop me after, before we said the greetings and so on. He said, Brother Michael, let's just stop here for a moment, and let us pray for our dear friends who are listening to us. He said, they're only doing their job. Let's just pray for them. Where did this confidence come from? Where did this assurance come from? Ah, because he knew that Jesus is interceding for him in the right hand of the Father. And they cannot touch him until God the Father says it's time to come home. And he had been home for a number of years now. Uh, he, Glorification, secondly, brings me secondly to the intercession for the sanctification. I know it's a big word. I'm, kids, I'm going to explain it to you in a minute. It's a big word, and the reason is, is because we don't use it. It's not in our regular vocabulary. We talk about sanctification only uh, with some holy people, but we should be using it every day. Verse 6, talking to the Father, Jesus said, I have revealed to you, to those, I have revealed you to those whom you have given me out of the world. After three years, our Lord Jesus poured his life, poured into the disciples. He poured into them. Day after day, he poured into them. And that is why. I'm going to be challenging you afresh in the next several weeks in this congregation of recasting the vision for the 2020s that everyone in this church must be either being discipled or a discipler. We don't need more pew warmers. I am not insulting you. I am begging you. The days are coming when we have to be following the model of Christ and discipling others. But look at Jesus' model of discipling. He did not only intercede for them, but he did not try to control them. Never. Read the Scripture. He did not try to keep them under his thumb. No, no, no. He did not try to frustrate them. As some of them displayed immaturity and selfish ambition. Some of them displayed doubt and unbelief. But that never stopped him from pouring into them. Beloved, pouring oneself into another is Jesus' model, and we must do it. Serving and giving mentorship is Jesus' pattern, especially as we possibly face some dark days. I believe with all my heart, not one, not one in this body of believers should walk alone. Look at verse 11. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. The power is where? In the name. The name that you gave me. We saw on the Christmas Eve, if you were here, that it was God the Father who gave Jesus his name. Not his adopted earthly father, not his mother. God the Father gave him that name. Verse 12. While I was with them, I kept them safe by the name <laughs> that you gave me. Only the son of perdition, 
referring to Judas Iscariot, who was pretending to be a believer. My goodness gracious, there's so many pretending believers. These were called the goats in the church. They are actually not pretending to be sheep anymore. Hear me right, please, it's important. What I'm going to tell you is the absolute truth, namely that with all of our faults and failures, with all of our fumbling and stumbling, and your pastors included, with all of our weakness and frailties, with all of our doubts and fears, God is protecting His disciples. My confidence is not in my holding into God, as some people say, let me tell you something, if that was the case, I would have been lost a long time ago. But my confidence because comes from the fact that He's holding me. He's holding me. He's holding me. Jesus is interceding for His disciples right now, which means that those who are eternally saved, those who know and love Jesus, uh, no one can steal their salvation. No one can deprive them of fellowship with Him. Jesus is asking the Father that you and you and you and you and me be protected from the schemes of Satan, from what's around the corner that we can't see, from the blind alleys. Protect them even from Mr. Putin, Satan too. <laughs> Verse 15. My prayer is that you do not take them out of this world, but you protect them from the evil one. And that is why you often hear me say, and I know some people misunderstand that, and I, I, I hope you don't, but if you do, that's fine. God bless you. It's not cockiness. It's not pride. It's not arrogance to say, and I'll keep saying it until I go and see him face to face. I am indestructible until God says, come home. Verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. <laughs> sanctify them by your truth. Sanctify them by truth. Your word is the truth. Your word is what? The truth. That's the truth. That is the truth. And not what Dr. Smellfungus or Pastor uh, Superduck has says. The Word of God is the truth. The Word of God is the truth. I'll never forget, back in 1990, and it stands very strongly in my memory, a minister in the mainland denomination, in anger, he looked at me and he said, how can you believe that whole Bible? What about those things that I disagree with? I really prayed very quickly. I said, Lord, give me wisdom. <laughs> and I looked him in the eye, and I said, what you need to start doing is asking yourself, not God, asking yourself the question, what's wrong with me? Because the problem is with you, not with the Word of God. He left in a huff. Now, beloved, don't ever forget, don't ever forget, don't ever forget Nothing will protect you from the world, the flesh, and the devil like the Word of God. The Word of God will keep you from sin, or sin is going to keep you from the Word of God. If you don't have a program of reading the Bible through in one year, start today. There are lots of programs out there, and there's zillions of them. And if you don't, ask Jeff or Zach or, or, or Mike or James. Ask one of the pastors, and they will tell you, they'll show you the varieties of it. I have started 33 years ago. I said 31, but really it's been 33. Time keeps flying. And I've been reading the Bible straight through with the chronological daily, daily Bible. I've been doing it for 33 years. Every year, I need discipline in my life. And I need to see January 1 and December 31. I want to go through day after day. Without the discipline, I can really mess it up. The word sanctify here, as I said, can be misunderstood because it's not in common use. 
And it's a big word, but some young people might not, you know, what sanctify means. Well, it means just simply every day you grow more like Jesus. Every day you're more set apart for Jesus. Every day, more and more of you belongs to Jesus. Let me give you something that even kids will understand. Even children will comprehend. You know, this is a comb. And I keep it. I know a dear friend is going to say, well, good, you're rubbing it in because you have hair. But I don't mean that. Listen, I'm just going to give the illustration so the kids can understand it. This comb is sanctified in me and to me. It's sanctified. It's dedicated. It's set aside for the use of my hair, not for any other purpose. You can't use it. Uh, I will not lend it to you because your hair might have bugs in them. Uh, I, I, I will not use it for anything else, for any other purpose, except for that, what it means for, for my hair. And let me go from the ridiculous to the sublime. You and I are set aside for Jesus. We set aside for His glory. Mind, body, soul, everything belongs to Jesus, not to anywhere else. You cannot use it for junk and you cannot use it for other stuff that does not bring glory to Jesus. That's what it means to be sanctified, to be set aside. He interceded for his own glorification. Jesus interceded for the disciples' sanctification. And thirdly, he interceded for our unification. Perhaps, I'm very careful choice of my word, perhaps no one knows more about the abuse, yep, you heard me right, the abuse of the word unity than I do. Maybe you know as much, but not more, I promise you. Uh, I'm happy to compare notes with you. In my years of ministering in the apostate church, a church that turned its back on the gospel of Jesus Christ, the word unity was often used to silence the Bible-believing Christians in many mainland denominations. Why? so that they would get their apostate agenda through. Their motto was as follows, doctrine divides, but love unites. Meaning, because they don't believe in the divinity of Christ, but I believe in the divinity of Christ, that is a disunity. I am causing disunity to the body. Doctrine divides. If I believe that Jesus rose from, the res rose from the dead bodily, physically, though when they don't, I shouldn't be preaching that because that divides. But love, love unites. But love, they mean, is that you bring all sorts of abomination and be accepted into the church. That is not love. That really is not love. In other words, you Bible-believing Christians, you better shut up, or otherwise we're going to call you unloving. No matter how abominable that agenda was. And listen, that is not the unity that Jesus is praying for here in Gospel of John chapter 17. The unity that Jesus is praying for is not organizational unity. It is not institutional unity. It is not denominational unity, but rather unity on the substance of the Christian faith. Unity of seeking the glory of Jesus above all else in life. It's the unity of the centrality of the gospel and the Word of God. 
It's the unity of believing that salvation is through Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, in the Scripture alone. Verse 22, I have given them the glory. I reveal to them your character that you've given me. I've shunned the light on how loving you are. Don't ever fall in the trap of these false teachers who tell you that the God of the Old Testament is not the God of the New Testament, that the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath, but the God of the New Testament is a God of love, absolutely false from the pit of hell. It is God of the Old Testament who sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross to redeem us. Verse 22 again, He's saying, I've revealed them, I revealed to them the character and attributes of God, and they're going to see it even more fully on the cross. Beloved, when we love one another, united on the gospel, united on the Word of God, united on the death and the resurrection of Jesus as the only way to heaven, we, we are revealing the character of God by loving one another. And that is why Whatever happens in the coming year or years, we can face it with confidence. We can face it with hope because we can see Jesus interceding right now with the Father that now He's claiming His own, appropriating His own glorification, but He's praying for us, for our sanctification, that we may be more and more like Jesus every day. He's praying for our unity around the Word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's praying for us to be united on the majors and minor on the minors and not get all sideways over silly things. That's the unity he's talking about. Can I get an amen? Amen. Father, I don't know how to thank you. I don't know how to express it in any language. That you have given us your word and that it can minister to us here in the 21st century. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his willingness and his obedience all the way to the cross. And we thank you for your faithfulness and glorifying him in heaven with you. We thank you that even now he's interceding on our behalf and he wants to see his children committed to him more and more like Him, more and more bringing glory to Him, regardless of how dark our culture and our world has become or becoming. And Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are here and those who are watching around the world. I pray that You would wake us up and that You stir our hearts to love You above all else in this world, because we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, praise the Lord. Let's stand together and sing to the Lord.